Hi, my name is John Garfield. It's April 14th, 2019. I've always had a concept of uh, spiritual warfare that I kind of got from the Frank Peretti books. You know, the scene is like a, <clears throat> a spiritual dogfight where, you know, machine guns are blazing and every once in a while, you know, demons are seen twirling, smoking, crashing. Uh, and from a more practical standpoint, you know, my thought about, you know, spiritual forces is that uh, you know intercessors gathered in a room identifying the name of the uh, principality or power or whatever and then we would all join hands and <clears throat> cast the thing down and the whole community would live happily ever after i didn't uh, that that was mostly a theory <laughs> okay <laughs> so uh, that's that's the theme so it's a couple nights back i had a vision for a couple who are good friends and I got up to capture it about 1 a.m. before it evaporated <laughs> and I uh, pushed save to see if I still believed it in the morning or if it was just too much pizza so I passed it on to them and it did encourage them and, and since then I felt like there was a more general application <clears throat> so I just changed the names to uh, Sue and I <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll uh, read it to you it's also in your blog so the scene was like being allowed to watch a reenactment of Jace, Jacob wrestling with what appeared to be an angel who took the form of a man. It's, uh, you know, the location was a dusty remote desert at night. <clears throat> and I was part of a large crowd watching. And I had the sense that the angel uh, had been sent with a message. And Jacob and this man or the angel were walking together and, and discussing Jacob's book or his destiny. Now, Jacob was uh, on his way back home to Esau, whom he had tricked out of his birthright, and uh, it, it, he had a good reason to be concerned <laughs> that Esau might not welcome him with open arms. So this conversation between Jacob and the angel ran its course, and the man um, was ready to leave. But Jacob grabbed his arm, and the negotiation wasn't finished. And the, and the man said it, it was... And that's when the wrestling match started. Now, this is all a vision. You know, it's not in the Bible. Uh, it's just a vision. Um, and just as a reminder, it's, this is, you know, a somewhat flawed vessel, and we prophesy in part, and we see in part. So <laughs> take it for what it's worth, for what you paid for it. <laughs> so <clears throat> I had this um, the sense that the angel took on the form of a man and was just playing along and in reality it was somewhat staged and he was much more powerful than Jacob and could have crushed Jacob like a bug anytime he wanted to however the wrestling went on a long time and uh, there was grunting and dust was flying and they both got dirty and the audience that was watching this included uh, the Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God <laughs> you know the heavenly host of angels, the cloud of witnesses everybody was there and uh, everybody was cheering for Jacob. Uh, this was like a stadium setting where um, there were not only ve viewers uh, on the on the uh, you know, in the balcony and then the stadium seats, but they were like on the ceiling as well. <laughs> so everyone was cheering for Jacob, and uh, yet they also knew who the angel or the man was. It, there was an awareness of that, and. And finally, the wrestling ended when the angel touched Jacob's hip, and the fight to ended, and, and the angel conceded the blessing because of Jacob's persistence. So now the scene switched to the wedding at Canaan, Cana, <clears throat> and the reenactment, <clears throat> I get, it was another reenactment scene. And I saw the crowd, I saw Jesus talking to Mary, I could see Jesus from behind, and I saw the expression on Jesus' face when she asked that he turn the water into wine. And uh, she, I, I could see Mary's beauty, her stature, and I could feel the respect that she drew. And she was very well dressed in this beautiful white gown. And uh, Jesus explained that it was not his time and he couldn't do what she asked. And, and Mary acted like she was in charge, you know, the mother, <laughs> and blew right past that explanation uh, of Jesus, you know, God with us, Emmanuel. And she caught the eye of uh, servants who were listening to the conversation and, and just politely told them to do whatever Jesus said <clears throat> and left. <laughs> 
So this scene too was very well attended and, and there was cheering for Mary when she turned from a conversation. But uh, as she walked toward us, it was Sue. And everyone was cheering for Sue, and I was amazed uh, that as one of the many who celebrated and greeted her as she joined us. So after that vision, it was like the spirit of wisdom took me by the hand and said, uh, let's go for a walk. I want to, want to talk to you. And what, what she said was there's a shift in the kingdom that heaven is celebrating right now. Spiritual warfare isn't primarily wrestling with darkness. It's more about sons and daughters contending for their book and the kingdom. The father's heart rejoices to see his son so aware of his business of their authority that they no longer just ask. They're no longer just asking questions. Um, they speak up in the council for their book and their place, and they're well aware of being chosen, and there are really no issues left about self. They are visible in the spirit even in seasons when they're hidden in the natural. And they do more than volunteer <clears throat> that their name be made great. They're willing to wrestle angels instead of demons. And they speak things into existence by their words and their deeds. They manifest on earth what they see in heaven and, and in their book. And they carry a sense that darkness is already defeated and that they are standing up in their place and displacing the forces of darkness without another fight. The, the fight is over, the, the Jesus already won. And they put on armor and stand against evil schemes and they quench fiery darts, but they do not fight with a defeated foe. They stand up in their calling and they displace <clears throat> or replace them. Real sons are replacing fallen sons in this hour. And Jesus won the warfare at the cross. So, uh, so now it's me talking to you. <laughs> Listen to John sixteen twenty three and twenty four. In that day, <clears throat> you will not ask me about anything. Truly, truly, I say unto you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, He will give it to you. Now, the sense of this is not asking a question, but asking in the, in the sense of placing a demand or a request to the Father, or, or releasing his power. Um, so, until now you have not asked for anything in my name, ask and you will receive so that your joy may be full. Um, and that's the sense of sons. We're not asking what to do, we're asking the provisions to accomplish what we know we're supposed to do. So, <clears throat> when you think of this, our, our evangelical roots in um, sin consciousness are somewhat at the expense of knowing we are created in his image and we carry his desires in our hearts. It's not completely balanced. <laughs> and our charismatic roots have been a bit preoccupied with demons and powers and principalities which do not need to be redefeated. Uh, the influence that remains is primarily um, sort of a deception. So Ephesians 6 and 2 Corinthians 10 talk about strongholds, vain philosophies, fiery darts. Um, they don't talk about warfare in the sense of fighting with principalities. They talk about uh, you know, the, deception, the deception from those. But if this, you know, the deception is not strictly at an intellectual level. So let me give you an example. Political ideas like socialism, global warming, uh, identity politics, and there's a long list, <clears throat> can't be defeated with logic. In other words, there, there's uh, a power behind that, those belief systems. And in the same way, we, we cannot just put on our spiritual boxing gloves and knock out a principality. <laughs> However, we do have weapons. And what we can do is stand up in our calling and shine the light of truth the experience of love and the persistence of faith. So warfare is real. The effects can even touch our finances, our health and our relationships, our politics, our nation, our cities. Um, but our job is to stand through the storm and simply resist the deception and watch it flee. And we defeat evil influences by replacing them. It's our job to, to occupy those seven mountains. So we do pray but we also engage 
and accomplish works and bear fruit. <clears throat> so yes, there really are powers and principalities and authorities and all that who do make the nations rage. A lot of things happening don't make any sense at all. Um, but the job of sons isn't to fight with them, it's to replace them in the, in the council and on earth. Uh, so we're not hunkered down under attack waiting for rescue. Uh, we are co-laboring with the Father to start another reformation that will turn nations back to the King of Kings. So spiritual warfare is more about contending for our book in heaven <clears throat> and being assertive about its implementation here on earth. The, the Father loves sons who are willing to contend with heaven. He loves that initiative. He loves the sense of the, the kingdom is taken um, by force, you know, but there's some violence involved. Um, he loves that, you know, warrior attitude that, that we're going to make it. We can prevail, um, even with him. It's as so though you go back and read the, the chapter about Jacob wrestling with the angel. Jacob calls the angel God, if you read that passage carefully, and the angel refers to himself as God. So I don't know what you do with that, but uh, it has some theological implications that we're being invited to contend with heaven for our inheritance and that uh, we have a father who loves that kind of attitude. Have a great week. God bless.